what is uniquely different about the times we live in now right like what makes 2020 to 2030 so different from any other time in human history is this is for the first time that spending time in a digital world is way more important than spending time in a physical world everybody keeps asking this question right how do i make million dollars how do i make billions of dollars but if you look at the way that people who have made billions and millions they've actually worked on something which was relevant 10 years ago and now it has become mainstream so you need to believe in something and get early in order to make that kind of money and in order to make that kind of wealth and that's exactly what this podcast is about we have talked about this new technology which everybody is crazy about metaverse nfts cryptocurrencies web 3.0 what is all of this how can you and me people normal people common people can make the most out of this opportunity what can you and me do so that we make maximum money what is this opportunity where you get to learn what are the sources where you can learn what are the people who are the people who are building this technology and how it can make sense to somebody who's invested in it or somebody who's just a beginner and want to get started this is exactly what we're going to talk about because today's guest has not only built and not only breeds this technology but have also invested and got an exit for more than 20 30 million dollars so make sure you watch this podcast till the end and our today's guest is sai and majorly he's known as sai tech so by the end of this podcast you're going to get to know why he's known as sai tech also this podcast is brought to you by coinswitch kuber Coinswitch Kuber is India's simplest digital exchange and trading platform for cryptocurrencies where you can start trading from only rupees 100 a simple fast safe and secure platform which allows you to start your crypto journey in the most user friendly way You talked about that you started with engineering like you you were in engineering college which college did you go to in Bangalore only Oh man so when people ask me this i just say india right like i don't go down to the second layer of specific <laughs> specifying which university it's from because nobody knows it it's this place called rv college of engineering which is uh, typically where uh, you try, you attempt for an iit you disappoint your parents once right and then you attempt for ai triple you disappoint did you disappoint your parents twice and then you settle for rv right like that so <laughs> that's the journey through there so where where is it where is the college it's not it's it's as much bangalore as the bangalore airport is bangalore okay is, uh, <laughs> it's it's a really far distance it's this desolate place in bangalore called kingeri okay. which is about a one and a half hour journey away uh, where you need to go to one way right so it was 3 hours to get to college 3 hours in college where i bunk classes and then <laughs> you contemplate for the rest of the day as to what the hell you're up to <laughs> so life was a very interesting trifecta of samosa canteen and my and my trip to college at that point of time okay but then what did you do with the trifecta like i know from there on you went to stanford huh. like what the fuck happened <laughs> about all of the disappointments all of a sudden you are like this one kid everybody's look up, looking up to all the aggression pent up i guess yeah uh, but uh, you very quickly realized that your four years are going to amount to nothing right like oh, yeah. engineering mm-hmm. just flies probably the easiest part of a four year time horizon that will just go by if you don't notice and you're deliberate about it is engineering i guess so at the end of my first year i said uh, let me go intern somewhere right like uh, as every engineer probably wants to do and i landed myself an internship at this chip design company and first day i borrow my dad's shoes overweight overweight guy back then and walk in and say like my, my i'm going to help a team that's going to change the world making new microchips i bring chai for my manager right like 30 feet away the machine's mm-hmm. right there yet i do that right so it, it the, the reality check started early right in mm-hmm. terms of the fact that no one's going to take you seriously yeah right and <clears throat> over a period of time i realized i have time right number one three odd years to do something number two there's no downside right like what is the worst that can happen in engineering by by you just trying things okay. your grades can probably dip a little more right we are already bad <laughs> right so <laughs> i had nothing to lose which meant that uh, i looked at an opportunity specifically when i was in my internship where in the education space no one was really building great software products that went on these low cost tablet pcs the akash tablet was a 35 dollar tablet pc yeah, that yeah, was supposed yeah. to revolutionize the world right it didn't revolutionize the country <laughs> but it just set into a rat race that you wanted to be part of what education plus hardware can sort of be like yeah and we started building some small software pieces around the same 
right? Okay. And we were then able to build and sell that to an educational institution, which then powers that into their tablet PCs and their learning management systems out there. So that's really was that was my first attempt at building something. Right? Okay. It wasn't this called was in on, college. First this year. was in college, right? Between my first and my second year. Okay. Right. So it wasn't called entrepreneurship. It wasn't. Uh, it didn't have structure to it. I built something because I saw a problem. I just wanted to probably scratch that itch at that point of time. And then from there, you slowly start realizing that you can institutionalize this, right? Like you can think sensibly about something in the world that needs solving that you can go after. What do you mean by institutionalizing? <clears throat> Almost think of it as why would you build anything at all, right? Like why would we go on a journey of creating something? Hmm. You wanted to do a specific function, inspire, make someone laugh, uh, stir action. There is something at the end of the tunnel. Now, with startups, very often we do something because we feel like it, right? Like especially in college, yeah. right? Um, and that's really where I stopped doing something because I can, which is as a guy who wanted to code, to probably doing something because someone else wants it to exist, right? Like solving for someone else, which is aka the customer, is not something you think through. In college, you are like, I'm going to redesign the college website. Who wants the college website to be redesigned <laughs> in the first place? right? <laughs> or I'm going to build an app that's going to get you your food from the canteen ordered 10 minutes faster. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's Dude, when... I remember the same thing, okay? <laughs> it's like I was in my college and this is a pure play, like a BBA college. Right. A... First, you talk about like IIT, AEEE, RV. Then comes five other colleges. Then comes like BBA colleges. Okay. <laughs> <Just say that. laughs> like nobody basically, nobody gives a fuck. Hmm. Because BBA usually, at least the kind of college where I went to, there are people who are either forced by their families to do something. Like, okay, okay like at least get a degree. Hmm. Or who couldn't get their hands on CA or something. So they are just trying to waste their time. It's like, okay just three years or get a degree or something. Get it or over. there are few people who are like toppers who are really good. They couldn't get out of the city because of XYZ reason because we were from tier two city. Mm -hmm. So there are like X number of factors that, oh, you can't go alone. You can't do this, you, all of that. So technically everyone is in the college. They are not willingly there. So nobody gives a fuck about college. Right. And I am there in college because I also dropped down from college in Mumbai. Ah, interesting. So I dropped out from the college from Mumbai, went to my city and I'm like, Okay, now that I'm here, I better do something. Hmm. And now I also want to create things. I'm, I had the same itch. Very cool. And I want to build, you know what? I want to build college mein experiences where I can build festivals where people can enjoy music and learning together. Okay, now interesting concept in my head. Like imagine college fest will have learnings and music together. Hmm. Realized A, nobody gives a fuck about festivals in college in my college specifically, because they are attending far <laughs> fancier festivals outside. B, nobody cares about learning at all. Mm. C, there's no, no one in college to support you to do any of this. Right. So the problem is only in your head. <laughs> like nobody <laughs> actually wants the solution of it problem because there is no customer. There is no one on the supporting side, no one on the consuming side. By the Same time we've happened. realized this, right, it's either too late, we've graduated, or we don't realize it at all, or we've just failed. Yeah. Right? There's no way to actually preempt that the dorm room is such a joyful place to build things that if this some this much of structured learning is somewhere there, right, it would have helped. Right. And we missed out the boat, I guess, right? Like we learned the hard way in that sense. But institutionalizing that probably is just like some way for every mathematics subject to probably teach you logarithms which you don't need in life. Probably if if, if some if things can be as as unnecessary as that, I'm sure entrepreneurship needs to be a more important part of what curricula is, right? So that's what I meant by institutionalizing. Institutionalizing, yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You were telling me more. Then you so, were like, okay, you try to uh, you try to solve this problem. You uh -huh. were trying to institutionalize after doing your first thing, the right. software for. So this school. goes well, and you're sort of you know building and moonlighting software for other education companies. So did you sell it? Did you start making money out of it? Right. So we scaled that up to about like what 10, 12,000 kids, and then eventually let that go to and uh, to a bigger edtech company that wanted to have that as a part of their internal competency. And we were building it as a project for them, basically, right? Okay. And uh, when once that sort of successfully ends as a journey, then what do you do next? Right? You think about that was your first exit. Let's theoretically, we theoretically. didn't know it was an, an exit, exit or, or anything like that. How like, many people were there? How many started? Three, three people. Yeah, it was the Together, whole. They just sat down. Three buddies. I'm sure you didn't have any 
like anything in your mind ki oh because you are good at tech i want you you are good at marketing i want you or you're doing was it my or just it like, was two others who can give me company at that point right like okay. practically two people who would not get tired of this who can stick around okay right? you don't think through right or at least i didn't think through right that that you have to have complementary co-founders you need to play to each other's mm-hmm. strengths have roles and responsibilities that are clearly demarcated out it's just like was it they're all rats in the same uh, cage let's probably like you know try chewing on the cage in order to get free that's it right like we all wanted to do something outside college which felt inspiring and we also wanted to do it at a point where you knew that you can stick around even though things are not going great yeah so did that and then said let's try this again right uh, one of the fo- the other two subsequently went on to work in places like apple and uh, cupertino so on and so forth right like so their journeys went through and i'm still in college these okay. guys were like 3 years 2 years ahead of me in terms okay. of uh, seniors I'm like okay what do i do now and uh, i assembled another team and then said this time around uh, let's pick up a let's pick up a bigger problem to solve and we went after this whole hyper local delivery after that okay yeah not a good idea <laughs> <laughs> that the so, hype oh, the man. real hype right now and which which year was this this was between my third and my fourth year right okay. so one a year and a half years ago like was it wow now i feel old uh, <laughs> 2014 15 i graduated in the batch of 2016 okay so uh, this was like was five years ago five years ago right so you were five years ago you were building hyper local something now it has become like really now it's cool. become a thing hasn't it mm-hmm. so uh, we joke internally that we might be right but we're just off by four years in timing mm-hmm. right so uh, no idea is wrong it's just bad timing bad time, uh, yeah at the end of it and I mean, we were both wrong and badly timed by the way but uh, what we decided to do was build build like an ai solution on top of whatsapp so we said why are you downloading 45 other apps in order to go place your hyperlocal orders it's got to be inside one whatsapp window where you just text what you want and you should get it right we'll do the hard work of extracting the sentiment the data points and probably giving you answers or telling you if the theater is going to be open or bringing you food doing your laundry basically like a one stop shop for everything that you needed there were a dozen players like us right we were out maneuvered uh, capitalized way better with other companies and we didn't execute that well right and uh, this was probably the first time that life takes you like pulls you up by the collar and hooks you left on the face and what fizzles out usually teaches you way more than like what works right and the fizzling out part i mean especially when you're in college is never graceful Yeah. it's not like you decide to you know not do it yeah it's beating a dead horse again and again and one more time right so that's basically how that journey went through and learned a lot from that right uh, and that's when i paused i said look you're graduated now as well and uh, you have a choice right? you can you can continue to go down the usual path the usual path is of course for engineers you study abroad right like yeah. your masters yeah it's simple and as that uh that's when you don't disappoint your parents mm-hmm. or uh, you continue to try building something in between or in, or you uh, if you find out some way that you're able to learn better right the option for me to build was very tempting but i also was aware that engineering didn't teach me shit right which mean which meant that i had to in some way learn a little before i apply my learnings to doing building a company that's when i was lucky that uh, i had like the entrepreneurship course at stanford that came through right and about 6 months of odd uh, rigorous processes there and like more essays than what i would wish to recount now uh, but finished all that through and then eventually they i continued to believe it was an excel sheet error but uh, they said <laughs> head on in right and uh, so did my time at stanford at gsb and that was awesome right and day, how, for how long you were there about a year year right so day 1 right i'm supposed to walk into class and this was a design thinking class right okay. and i'm like uh, i was a little full of myself right i said boss design thinking right like we've done this right we've seen enough youtube videos out there <laughs> or we've seen enough blogs that tell you what design thinking is mm. you're not going to teach me something new i walk into that class with a bit of uh, spunk right i don't believe i have been intellectually humiliated more in a 60 minute period of time that you don't know anything at all right and that was great right it very quickly resets you into staying low keeping your head down to the ground and learning i think the first class was a very quick starting point for that for me and uh, then spent the rest of the year just with peers who were incredibly competent right exceptionally hungry and the average of the room ends up 
pulling you forward right you are the sum of the five yeah. and uh, here i'm the sum of the 100 that are around me and that helped like tremendously so i had much to thank for in terms of sanity right and you now you're as a tech guy you're an outsider in a business school mm. right and that's the world is suddenly upside down right like there's there's a lawyer there is a media person there is a consultant they look at you and you're like oh you are the tech guy like what do you mean you are the tech guy you aren't right like so when you're in engineering you don't realize this yeah. right like what an echo chamber you live in and that helped again right uh, where you're able to learn from so many more diverse sort of views in life apply that and then realize that tech is one way to solve a problem it's not the solution itself right tech is employed to solve yeah it's 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 a tool mm-hmm. right we often as engineers and com- and if you're like especially a programmer right you'll 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 think that the tech is the be all end all yeah very rarely is right like uh, almost never is actually right so that's really what business school teaches you right building a company is very different from building code or like building a project yeah right and that's probably where i paused i said okay i don't know if i'm any wiser but at least you can try right so i then got back to india but before i got back to india i was able to convince my co-founder uh, at scape called ajay uh successfully that he should quit a perfectly well doing ar vr startup back in the bay area and said uh, dude you got to ride this horse with me and uh, for some strange reason he said yes okay we got back to india we raised around and then we started building scape it okay. that's really no, no, you you skipped a great part there okay like you skipped everything <laughs> first how did you find like who's the ajay guy like how did you find him oh man uh so i spent a little bit of time taking a small tour around chikmagalur right which is a part of uh, karnataka which is known for its coffee okay as uh, just like you are addicted to caffeine might as well embrace it at this point right <laughs> and uh, the guy who was running this resort said there's only one other loony who i know of in my circles who keeps saying virtual reality virtual reality right and i kid you not he just said only two people in my entire network repeat this term hmm. it's the two of you i think the two of you should meet and when we did catch up interestingly it seems to be that our parents have been neighbors in chennai in this literal same apartment which traces back for like two decades now so wait right so it's like i mean that was serendipitously nice and later we realized that we have a shared interest in terms of what we want to do how we want to build things through so the that that sort of courtship existed for about mm. half a year and then we said boss you are doing something i want to do something let's get down to it let's try building and that's really where the journey started through it so it was really about i've i've realized that life for me has advanced non linearly through two things someone has decided to take a bet right like given me a shot and the other time is when someone has engineered some serendipity for me saying ah oh, the two of you should meet or the two of you should probably uh, end up doing business with each other etc so it's been engineered serendipity on one side as well as uh, a, a a leap of faith on the other side and that's the only thing that's pulled me forward and that's how you guys that's always been the case right like yeah. always you have gotten but i'm sure that this is not how startups are built <laughs> <laughs> i wish this it. is probably this is your idea <laughs> this is how you got done but for before we move forward or how did you get into building part and stuff why don't you tell everyone like what is capic quickly in like 60 seconds so that people who don't know about it have like a great idea about what exactly we're talking about here under the pump yeah uh 2018 when we started scapic we said look when things in the world have gone from mainframes to desktops desktops to laptops laptops to smartphones the way we have interacted with computers has changed every yeah. 15 years it's not going to stop with the smartphone why should it the next big thing is right here right wearable devices that you can now literally project holograms using if that future is going to come through someone has to build software that makes it easy to develop these virtual and augmented reality experiences mm-hmm. like how when you wanted to build a website you initially tried coding you were horrible at it then you went to wordpress it was a little better then you went to wix it was even yeah, better, better right so we were building the wix and wordpress for virtual and augmented reality we said Ooh. look you don't need to code if you want to build the metaverse i'm giving you a drag and drop tool in order for you to jump right in build an ar or a vr experience that will work in your browser from day 1 you just come in drag and drop things like canva exactly like canva actually and then hit publish and you're good to go so wait so do even i didn't know about it <laughs> <laughs> wow i know that the nft side of you this was 
this is something new but now that you so you are a, you are a big believer of vr space i mean of course and the wearable device is going to be like my first interaction with wearable device i'll tell you i saw this video went viral on youtube about mm. of pranav mystery i guess ah yes six of course sixth sense dude it blew my mind <laughs> i remember for a month yeah. not kidding not exaggerating for a month every day i googled where the fuck can i find this device <laughs> like how can i buy i was like even and there were rumors right it's for 600 dollars it's for yeah. 400 dollars i'm like i'm ready to like you know convince my parents sell my car do something i want to be this cool this is what i want yeah. this is like this cool thing i want like six and device to that blew my mind like mm-hmm. it was just portray the, those pictures out there i think now that is coming to reality true that is going to be through your maybe glasses or watches and all of that and those projection is something what scaping is going to help us build completely right? right make it really simple for a creative person to not bother about code just sit and build damn good vr and ar experiences that's it so next time my workshop is going to be like this so i'm going to give people like devices on their in their houses and they can have like virtually they can see me speaking while they're doing and i can do all of that through scaping for sure yeah i think that's that that's a good start and and that's probably the vision that's coming to life now right where everyone's saying look you're going to spend so much time in the metaverse so on and so forth it all starts with the device which you're wearing and or using and then the experience that can power it and both sides now we are at a phase where it's actually possible mm. right like no other point of time in human history will your brain be tricked into believing that it's in the amazon rainforest or yeah. be tricked into believing that it's in a beach now these displays devices and the fidelity of them are so good that you would see videos where people are wearing them and going and crashing into their tvs right <laughs> or falling down because your brain's truly believing that it's right there yeah right and that's uncanny right and that means that you've finally hit a point where things from here can only get better and better better and better in terms of convincing you that there is a completely parallel world that you can live in but how far are we from that oh not too far at all actually but how many years would if you want to put it like i'll put this it? in context right um the most popular virtual reality device that's selling today is a device called the Oculus Quest 2 right the quest yeah. 2 is a 300 dollar device that you can buy put on your face and do play like hundreds of thousands of games on yeah it. and work out like beast and do all of this the whole thing over the last 12 months the quest 2 has sold about 10 million devices for context 10 million was the same number of iPhones that were sold between year 1 and year 2 right 10 million was the same number of Xboxes that are sold when a new Xbox launches and 10 million is the same number of ps3s that are sold when the ps3 launched which means that this critical mass is hitting sooner than we think right Damn. and it's it's like a very ps2 nintendo moment right like things will only get better from here generation after generation it's not going to be graphical fidelity that you're suddenly like holy shit this is better than real world but we are very quickly getting there yeah and the rumors are that over the next 12 to 18 months we have at least two massive launches from what i hear from two big companies that are like a generational leap ahead from where the quest 2 is because the quest 2 itself is like a 14 month old device now and what's coming next is probably like super exciting and if this is at at an xbox level or an iphone first generation level you can now expect that that graph to follow a similar pattern even if it does half the similar pattern there over the next 5 years we're talking about a billion people using this insane who this is Okay, we're gonna come to this before we let let's close the loop on the Scapex story, Please. and then we come back to the Quest Two part, and then you're gonna you're gonna help us and everyone. What all can we do with this? Hmm. Okay, because why there's an even need for this? All of that we'll talk about. But let's close the loop on that Scapex. You built it, you were passionate about it, you know that this is where the world was going. You realize everything, and then the then it got acquired. Hmm. So how did that happen? Did you reach out? Did they reach out? what was it frankly and, it's a bit of a strange dance here okay it's like uh, you've seen these what did you do because most of the time what happens people are excited they build something good they don't know how to scale it right. they don't know how to scale it to a level where some big player one goliath will be interested in like someone like you and be like okay let me grab this grab this and help you build out with us why don't you use the power and the money we have and take it for your fun right <laughs> very interesting and I think M&As are not spoken about as much as yeah. well, right? Like especially in the Indian scenario. Uh, 
good companies are bought, not sold, right? Which is the best time to sell a company is when you don't want to probably sell a company, and which is where most good acquisitions happen. So during a typical M&A process, here is what might occur. Um, one of your customers, usually, right? You have sort of started building a relationship with them, and uh, there's you have slowly started getting them acquainted to what the hell are you building? Is it even useful for me? And do I have some gains from that at any point of time? The moment that happens, it's almost like building a rapport with someone, right? Before you, uh, before you ask them for a huge favor. Mm. So you get to know the person. And then you slowly start getting entrenched in their lives. So the big company gets entrenched in the small company's lives in some way or the other, usually as a customer, yeah. right? Or as a partner, an integrator, we can call it what we want. Once this relationship is usually set in, you then try to deepen that relationship because of two things. One, the startup thinks this guy can be absolutely milk, right? Like there is a source of revenue here which is super lucrative. Yeah. The big guy now looks at innovation that can't happen internally, mm. right? It's the classical innovator's dilemma, which is my company is so big, if I decide to do something meaningfully different, it's going to hurt my existing shareholders and customers. Yeah. Which means I've got to steer and I've got to stay on course. But, oh my God, I'm missing on so many opportunities on the side because I'm staying on course. So where do I innovate? I innovate by virtue of acquiring innovation from outside. Mm -hmm. Inorganic growth. Yeah. Right? Because I simply can't foster, cultivate and build that sort of team internally. Right? Not because it can't be done, but because my priorities are very different. Yes. Right? So which is where a big company looks at a smaller startup at areas where it it can be outmaneuvered. The one thing that startups always look at is, they're like, what if Google builds this? Yeah, Google will never build it, right? Google has a hundred things to do before they bother about something which is as breadcrumbs as what you might be going after, yeah. right? The chances of you shooting yourself is a lot higher than the chances of Google coming and shooting you, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's really the, the same case with m as well. If you steer course and you're able to build something where a big company feels like you are outmaneuvering them through speed. The only advantage startups have, the only, is speed. A smaller guy can move quicker than the big large guy. Yeah. And if you show that enough number of times in an area which is important to the big guy, that's where the deal happens. And by the time you have done this, right, you actually don't have too many reasons to sell. Because somewhere you're sort of getting revenues from this guy, you're getting revenues from more people. So the reason you decide to sell is also because they are doing something that you don't have access to. Yeah. Right? And in our case, that was 150 million Indians. Right? My goal was to build augmented reality and virtual reality as fast as possible to as many Indians as possible. Now, that's a goal I can't do as a small-scale startup. Right? Access and distribution is often something that the big company can crush for you. Mm -hmm. Case in point, Instagram. A billion-dollar acquisition was today $300 billion minimum in terms of the meta ecosystem. And that was possible because Facebook put its weight behind Instagram yep. and allowed that sort of distribution to come together. Very similar here. And in this scenario, uh, what we decided to pull the trigger on was, look, you can build a product as much as you want. But if not, people are not using it, who cares? Right? And that's really where this made a lot of sense for us. Right? Post-pandemic, uh, e-commerce was like suddenly booming, right? Everyone staying at home apparently wants to shop now. Yeah. And as they do that, AR becomes an important way to uh, go about it. It can be as trivial as throwing a lipstick on your face or something as important as showing exactly how the furniture looks in front of you. But that spectrum is going to be important. And why is because we've been, people have even made memes of this, right? Like what I order online versus what ends up in my doorstep. Completely different. Yeah. Right? Like expectation, reality is... We've trolled e-commerce on this for years now. And we still keep on doing still that, do still it. works. As that, a content, it works. <laughs> there is this one guy in Diwali who will get a brick instead of an iPhone, boss. Like, <laughs> as a rule, right? Like, yeah. he will get a brick instead of an iPhone and he will tag everybody in Flipkart. He will tag 5,000 people in Flipkart and make it very visible that, look, I have gotten a brick. Did you? Nobody knows, right? But the part that AR really solves in this case is that expectation gap, right? You don't trust an e-commerce system enough. You don't expect the e-commerce system to really deliver exactly what they should, especially if they are not tier one, right? Like yep. you go to a slightly more nondescript site, your, your alarm bells are on, You're like what if this guy runs away? And AR sort of solves for a lot of that. 
what you order is exactly what you would get because what is in augmented reality can now be a 3D scan of the actual product that they're selling. Yeah. Right? That gives you a size, fit, finish. You showed me that, right? I remember. Right? You showed me that that particular feature where I could wear all the different kind of shoes and check on my device. Dude, that was insane. And it looked as if I'm having a picture as if I'm really wearing it. Right. I wondered at that time, like, am I wearing the same shoe or no? <laughs> and that was really, really good. And now if you take from makeup, shoes, clothes on the human body and also furniture or accessories for your house, you suddenly start looking at the camera as a place where commerce happens, which has never been before. And that's really where it made a ton of sense for us. And we said, let's build it. Let's build it together. And yeah. they so you eventually started with building relationship. You try to deepen it. And then one day the conversation happened and you were like, okay, let's do this and let's take it forward. What you said makes sense both for like quoting a girl as well as selling a startup. Exactly the same sentence flow. But yes, we sold a startup. <laughs> Everyone said like, this is the third <laughs> podcast of the day and everyone has been quoting the same thing. It's exactly <laughs> like the girl. It's exactly like the dating. It's exactly like the crush. I don't know what's this. Your sentence. Bangalore. <laughs> Am I giving this vibe that I would be interested in this or... Or is it because the Bangalore has a vibe? If three people are spotting the same pattern, maybe it's introspection and not reflection. <laughs> what the hell is wrong <laughs> with you? <laughs> All right. Okay, so then this happened. And then you got excited about more of this because now obviously you have, as, as somebody who's building as a partner, you have more time than as a founder. Because founders usually have lesser time because you have to do 10 things. Now out of those 10 things, you have outsource kind of eight things to the bigger giant, two things you're focusing on, which is as this building, core building. Hmm. Okay. And that's when you started getting deep in, into more into the metaverse, the world, which is where your escaping is really going to make sense. Right. Right. What is this world about? Everybody has been talking. In fact, dude, the biggest of the biggest influences of the world, like the business influences I'm talking about, like you talk about, Mark Zuckerberg or Kevin O'Leary or Gary Vee, like the social media muggles, not... In fact, talk about Elon, talk about Mark Zuckerberg, these people. They all are saying that world is going to change. Like we are going through, we are going through that shift, which was the early internet days. And we all get it. We all have been hearing this because communication is faster. Through social media, we can see that Facebook got turned into meta. Okay. And this is a master move. <laughs> Great. We all are looking at this. But even after studying, like I've been reading about it since 30 days. After reading it for 30 days, I don't get shit. I don't understand what this Web 3.0 is. Hmm. I try to, in fact, do it as a oh, Web 3.2 as a creator economy. Web 3.0 as a creator economy. As with, in, <laughs> in relation to storytelling, in relation to selling, in relation to market platform. I don't get shit. Right. I don't understand what metaverse and all of that is. Why... How can it help me and how how can I understand all of this? Right. Quick disclaimer, if someone comes to you and tells you that they are an absolute expert at the space, that's when you run, right? Okay. Because that's how early the space is. None of us are. We're all blind leading the blind and trying to figure it out. I've been spending six and a half years in trying to build startups around the AR and the VR space and I still don't consider myself anywhere near this. But it is exciting, isn't it? Which is, for the first time, we now are able to um, anticipate what the evolution of the internet itself is going to be like. So let's backtrack before all that mumbo jumbo, right? What is uniquely different about the times we live in now, right? Like what makes 2020 to 2030 so different from any other time in human history is this is for the first time that spending time in a digital world is way more important than spending time in a physical world. Yeah. Right? Going for a walk is a luxury. Staying in front of your laptop for 15 hours a day is a necessity, right? Our parents, our grandparents and everybody before us probably had it the other way around, right? Um, appreciating nature is a luxury. Coexisting with it was something that was a necessity for our parents, right? I think we have increasingly started to prioritize what's online or what's on a URL more than what's IRL. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's, gonna, that's only going to get amplified between now and five years or 10 years from now. With that, that's the starting point, right? Three things will change, right? Computing, content, and commerce. That's it, right? Like, let's start there. Computing. Shit's getting more realistic. Shit's getting faster. And it'll also get more personal, 
right? Your smartphone was an incredible device because you literally touch the info, right? Mm. It's a very personal device. The personal computer was supposed to be personal, and the smartphone made it even more personal. What's the ultimate realization of that? Throwing things on your face, right? And that will happen. Right? That's that's on the hardware side that we spoke about. As that happens, you very quickly realize that your human behavior is going to stay the same, but where you exhibit this behavior is going to be online as compared to offline. Yeah. Right? What is this human behavior? I want to show off. Right? I want to tell you that I own something unique, expensive, and rare. Yeah. NFTs. Right? Human behavior is I want to be rewarded for some action. Tokens. Human behavior is that. i need to find a way in order to socialize with someone in three dimensional space the metaverse right so what the metaverse really says is as computing changes gets to your face as content changes becomes completely 3d and as commerce changes because it becomes digital first as compared to a physical first product why is all of this being done on a on a, on the current version of the internet it's going to be done on an evolved version of the internet which we all collectively call as the metaverse right now Okay. Right? It's taking your existing behavior, dialing it up to eleven, and then putting it into a space or a three D enclosure that everyone will now possibly have access to through a VR or an AR headset. And we now say that seems to be the internet, but that's a two D rendition of the same. Versus here, it's a far more immersive rendition of the same. Welcome to the metaverse. Dude, this makes so much sense. I want to simplify it for people. Okay, I have very random examples in my head. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but you correct me there. Okay. So what do you mean to say? is human behavior is going to be same right and we are already seeing that shift that people are caring about digital first digital more than the offline things right we are seeing that in business businesses care more about what url they have rather than <coughs> what location they open the showroom on right this is happening this is going on because they want to own that dot com of a specific name so that people visit and it's easy for them to go so they are buying that off in higher prices and want that more than this and yeah. it's just one link one word it's happening okay then we all want to show off that blue tick on our instagram accounts right it's i mean it's a flex so people who have it they're flexing it out people who do who don't have it they're ready to pay a lot of money which they would have easily be used like they would have used that to buy a jewelry mm. they don't want to buy jewelry anymore <laughs> they want their blue tick so that focusing on the digital aspects of it rather than this and this all happened i think one more example i can think of gary v said this was this happened in farmville nice right yeah. so in farmville what happened we all played that and we were like spending more hours we were spending money to buy those coins yeah. so that we can grow like fancier crops just to have the social show off in front of our friends ki we have something unique and a bigger land and a best the best crops and the fancier crops which you don't have right so we already have been seeing this and the more and more we get digital the things get on our devices obviously you're going to look people from the perspective of just this one device which is going to be in front of you not here right so it's going to be more relevant that is what you mean to say right. and once that happens maybe you want to hang out with on a social platform because people want socializing right people want to comment people want to do all of that it's not far where instead of dming each other you would like be in let's say some some pluto or you and then you'll be <coughs> chatting there and going hand in hand going their holograms will be talking precisely all of that like this is what you mean and this is how the social is going to be like the behavior is already being seeded offline which yeah. is let's say i go to the food i eat is in a, in a in a fancy cafe designed for you to instagram about it yes the place itself is now built in such a way that i snap a picture put it out there on on yeah. socials in fact the content the blogs have been written like now the most popular blogs are the ones top 15 instagramable cafes in this city not the top 15 who have the best food right and you, from there let's assume you go to a concert the same yeah. day what do you do in the concert you don't listen to the music you hold your phone up in order to record that for an hour and a half yeah right like that's that's it why is all of that being done offline in the first place the space you hang out in the music festival that you go to as well as uh, the people you talk to can all exist in a in a 3d shared space yeah. and so we've been doing all of it probably in a clunkier manner if i were to think of it in 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 like the uh, real world as compared to the metaverse just jumps in and says i'm giving you a device that's good enough 
for experiences that are crazy enough that you can spend with your friends that you never could have in the past. Oh yes. And the commerce also going to get changed out of this. What I'm imagining is let's say if we all are sitting here, I have this device on my head like in my eyes and all of a sudden we are walking on the street and I saw this guy wearing those shoes. Oh like damn, there was nice shoes. I can just like click bot add Absolutely. to cart and it's going to get done. Yeah. Right? It's like by walking because most of the time we buy things by looking at other people what they are buying. And now when people be walking around, oh, I like that T-shirt. Click. I yeah. like that belt. Click. Like this is what how the comma is gonna get shaped as well. And here's the cooler part. You mentioned that when you saw the shoes on your uh, foot, that it was compelling enough that you thought, wow, that's the real deal. Imagine if you're walking down the street and someone else, when you specifically look at those shoes, there is a digital NFT on top of that, which allows you to simply augment virtual fashion. Hmm. Those shoes can be like a crazy fluorescent color. it's not fluorescent in real life but when you see that through an augmented reality pair of glasses you can now have digital fashion completely springing through on anybody's t-shirt uh, sneakers and anything else that you want which means self expression on top of a normal looking piece of clothing can now be absolutely anything that you wish for it to be sweet so normal clothing can be as comfortable as possible <laughs> and then like for the show off part you don't have to be uncomfortable at all because By you can far. do that through that's intense okay i get it now and i'm excited about it okay i really see that the computing is going to change so computing is not my era not not my arena i don't understand it as of now maybe 5 years later i decide to become a techie like you and i get on the same path and i'm going to bother you again be like okay now i want to learn all of this <laughs> then it makes sense but today it doesn't but what are the content in the commerce part how can people like me and the people who are listening or people like my team we are not from the tech background how do we take the advantage of it what are the first let's say what are the opportunities for us right so what can we build or do or bet on so that we make at the end of the day we want to make wealth mm-hmm. we want to produce something we want to create something which makes us happy and we want to be just we want to show off as well so all three things how can we do how can we find opportunities i think creators are creators are just outrageous at building value there and uh, being resourceful about that value in terms of how it's built uh the most amount of horsepower for uh, for creativity or like thought is probably in the space now with that uh, the the cool part is computing very quickly follows the content commerce or rather leads the content commerce part how is let's go to the smartphone again because the smartphone existed is why an instagram and a tiktok existed in the first place yeah right the device means whole new ways of engaging with content start to come up which then leads to a absolute industry of creators who do incredible things on that platform the same is now applicable as we go into the metaverse you will have virtual influencers who are completely ai generated or 3d generated CGI. who can be complete cgi right and they could be running music concerts for all you know yeah right like marshmallow is a guy who's probably wearing that uh, that 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 whole gear right now and going about the concert but marshmallow in a metaverse is can be nobody right? yeah uh it can just be generated by a programmer sitting in his basement and absolutely crush it now the way that we can now be creative is just absolutely no limits right uh the parts that would immediately show up is on something called virtual land right which right. is just like the way you have real estate in uh, in your bangalore and mumbai you're going to have real estate in the metaverse yeah and then this real estate is going to be bought and sold believe it or not and people are paying a pretty penny for it right like yeah. i'm talking in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to own pixels on the internet right and the reason they do that is because they want to now build on that land yeah so you as a creator imagine if you had the chance to build uh, your own private area in uh, in your neighborhood which would have just been the creator house mm. right that's a that's a monumental annoying task but in the metaverse that's actually really simple right you can buy virtual land and set up a, like a creator house which is truly what you think art should be right someone comes into that house they're going to spend a lot of time with you as the person the things that you want them to feel right this could be music this could be um, inspiration this could be art and then at the end of this all they then have a chance to buy an nft right in order to show their solidarity and support about the fact that i truly am here to support the creator in the first place so the metaverse is incredible from the standpoint of experience creation in the virtual space the second is digital fashion right uh fortnite skins right like things that you throw yeah. on your character is a 60 million dollar business annually yeah. right and that's like kids buying skins in order to distinguish 
what their character is with someone and that's it it doesn't even give you a comparative advantage in the game now imagine that but at a complete fashion level right like the things you wear the avatars that are there or even in augmented reality right like i'm if i'm looking at you right now and you decide to accessorize yourself with an ar hat that's your choice right yeah. and that digital fashion is going to become a whole other space that creators can now go after anybody who's dropping merch today technically should look at ways in order to uh, engage with digital fashion to engage with their community even further and the last part is uh, around uh, is around the commerce part right mm-hmm. which is creators now can monetize through tokens and non fungible tokens wait what the hell right a token is simply a way for me to buy in to your promise even before you have delivered it right you go on and you state tomorrow that i'm going to do a 100 podcasts next year yeah right and now i think of you as a, as 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 a as a company listed in the stock market yeah right and the company has made a promise holy hell that seems a good promise i'm going to go and buy shares right which is what we typically do now what if that's a token that i purchase off the person quite literally right i hold on to that and you live up to your promise right you deliver upon what you claimed which meant that your credibility is now being built more people have been in your sphere of influence and they are now willing to ride this journey with you even further yeah what a share market does right and that's ex- but now decentralized to the point of individual people is really where we can start off at so the next project that you embark on can possibly be funded even before you start human ipo completely right so that's the commerce part where it starts with the person the things they decide to monetize or put out and then eventually anything that is creative that they can put out there it's almost like a digital renaissance all of a sudden right which is people are truly appreciating art creativity and technology coming together and willing to pay a price that is fair and just to the creator in this case and not by running an ad in front of your face and mm-hmm. this is probably some of the best times to exist and try to innovate no it makes sense for all the artists it makes sense because now if i feel let's say i'm going to become big hmm. example i say one podcast example give me 5 lakhs of revenue and i'm going to do if i make it big one podcast going to give me 5 lakhs of revenue and i'm going to do 100 podcast in a year right okay but today one podcast only giving 50000 so what i want to do is in order to scale i want you guys to buy my thing at a valuation of 50000 right take like 10 p 10 tokens of me out of the 100 tokens which are available and then when it becomes 5 lakh every episode you're going to get 50000 right because the 10% you own it okay. this is what you mean so every time i'm going to make it simplify this is like we build on a imaginary world let's talk about the real world this is what happens with artist so spotify right youtube streaming like youtubers so every time the spotify artist let's say if i believe in someone artist some artist some musician is going to become big or some youtuber is going to become big and i bet on very early on okay okay oh i feel this content is really good he is only on 10000 subscribers let me bet on him i buy his tokens right. and then tomorrow this guy becomes really really big so every time he does a brand deal he does something he does big things i get a piece of it and i get to make money throughout the throughout my life completely based on his success and imagine all of this without the centralized authority if you identified pratik wad before like the first 100 streams on spotify you got nothing except some bragging rights probably in life yeah. but if you had found the same guy in web3 right in a, in a in a tokenized platform that would probably be a meaningful four digit five digit differentiation in terms of the tokens that would have appreciated at that point of time and that is why web3 is so much more incentivizing the users who come in early and are able to spot the right things at that point of time so but now the game is only going to be about the 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 game is going to be three things okay one how well you know your art whatever you know you can build or make money out of it but you need to know something really really well okay second is how quick you are you able to understand and go with your gut feeling like how how fast you can take risks in order to capitalize on the people who are building up in your community so that you can build on them or maybe invest on them and do things and the third is how quickly you are ready to learn and create yourself so that you keep experimenting let's say you want to experiment like a virtual creator house if that works you scale it up if that doesn't work you build a virtual music concert if that works it doesn't work so you need to be i think everything which entrepreneurship stands for 
you need to do that faster in order to scale on digital world that's all completely and and the space has been moving at the rate of knots right like a thousand odd projects would be launching on a daily basis right now and probably 900 failing right and that's the beauty of it right what's the best time to climb mount everest not when it's littered with dead bodies right it's the best time to climb it is when it's probably early when yeah. people don't know enough about it yeah you need to be in the ground floor of innovation and, and that ground floor opportunity comes very rarely. The last time it did was what, 2007 with the iPhone? And the time before that was 1994 with the internet. Right? So you don't get such opportunities in terms of being part of cultural and technological changes at the very inception. And that's probably the precipice at which we stand right now. And this is our time. Completely. Our time is now. <laughs> like this, this is my tagline for my speech is also like, this is us nice. and our time is now. So apt, yeah. I, like, I genuinely say so this apt. say this so often after I end every speech when it comes like I mean I'm talking about live stage speeches not like Solid. the digital ones I'm like. talking about the offline ones <laughs> <laughs> where I used to do this I used to say this okay now for everyone who's listening where can we learn about these things so that it makes more sense for us and I'm talking about from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know anything about it, who has zero clue Right. Like doesn't understand computing technology from people who are like very normal people, day to day work, who are probably going to discover this podcast for the first time. 30 minutes, they'll be sleeping. 20 minutes, they'll be like, oh, dude, okay. I can't figure out. They're going to revisit again from the beginning. And they're like, okay, what's happening? I don't know. Where do I learn? What do I do? I think I would look at the metaverse more like a journey than a destination, right? Like just getting started. There are a hundred and fifty ways for you to enter this space, right? Okay. You can be a you can be a trader who wants to make a quick buck, right? And crypto is a great starting point. You can be an artist and you want to drop your own NFTs, and hence NFTs are a great starting point. You can be a programmer and AR VR makes sense, right? You can that can be a starting point as the way I got into the space. Or you could be an architect, right? And you can say, look, buildings exist in real life. Mm. What the heck, you're telling me buildings will exist in the metaverse? I want to try that, mm. right? So, or you could be a community manager in a co-working space offline. And you're going to be like, the concept, the way humans think is the same. I'm going to manage a community in the metaverse, right? And that's a really important skill to have. Co-working places in metaverse. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> and uh, which means that the logical starting point is actually not to prescribe, but to just pause. Take a look at the role you're in today. Right? There's a very strong chance in some way, format or shape that's going to translate right mm. into a web3 platform right we're not we're not upending society we're accelerating the way it's functioning in a digital world which means whatever you're doing today will simply be crazier when you do it in web3 and in, in the metaverse let's probably start there as a profession if you are in the creative aspect i think just logging on to opensea and trying to just figure out what the what the hell nfts are is a start I've always prescribed that getting your hands dirty is probably the best teacher, right? So a 5,000 word article or blog, probably written by like Ben Thompson from Stratechery is cool, is great. It's not going to teach you exactly how to go about it. So I would say fail and fail fast. Mm. Best way to learn. Buy your first NFT, get your hands burnt, right? Or uh, buy your first token, get your hands burnt. Very rarely are you, you going to nail it or hit a home run in your first shot, right? You're not going to hit a six the first time you face a grade A fast bowler when you're a village cricketer. Yeah. Right? And that's exactly the same thing here. Why would you expect your first investment of 100 rupees on a shitcoin to suddenly give you a 1000x? Don't. Start. Right? I would say, get going. Get your hands burnt for a second. That teaches you. Right? You're like, why did I go wrong? And that, in, that intrinsic human annoyance of what did I mess up probably teaches you way more through that journey than anything else. Right? So, um, if you want to go about learning about the metaverse per se, I would say just find the closest place where you can have access to a virtual reality or an augmented reality headset. Just go try it out. Right? I think way too many people speak about the metaverse without necessarily experiencing VR or AR before that. Right? Like uh, because it's fashionable, right? It's it's easy to go at it. Yeah. Right? And um, I think the starting point is just take a look at it. Understand what can be done, what can't be done. And then probably you will automatically start joining the dots from what you're good at, what you like versus what you can make money with. Makes sense. That has a lot of entrepreneurship lessons, actually. You know, it's not, we didn't, 
I thought that we were going to talk a lot about VR, AR and <laughs> NFTs, but we talked a lot about human behaviors and how humans can succeed in their lives. Right. Because that's what we talked about. We talked about asking questions, having a thing to build startups or build something just to solve problem, then institutionalizing things, then trying to figure out how the heck I can learn more about it, then mixing and matching 10 different kind of fields so that you can bring out and build better solutions, then understanding who's the big guy who's the small guy trying to sell services to the small guys and the big guys then big guys are going to give you revenue so you deepen your relationships with them once you deepen the relationships you build something meaningful once you build something meaningful now you're going to have enough resources to outsource it so that once you outsource it you only focus on the creating part of it then you'll have another time so for the time when you have you dig deep on the process of what you're building once you dig deep on that particular part you're going to explore the new ways and you're going to understand human behavior and you're going to see the patterns which are helping you succeed in a particular industry and that is ludicrous if whatever i said this in last one minute if people could just point that out and start learning about those things which i just talked about i think that itself can teach them a lot about building a startup or building a life which they dream or desire right now Finally, all of this started because of bad grades. <laughs> we'll have that. This lot started in because of bad grades. <laughs> this genuinely, like podcast, figuring out the name, figuring out came because I was bad at school. <laughs> I was horrible at school, and uh, I used to keep telling my dad that you know I'm going to figure out something. Yeah. And I was like, so I was trying to build my startup. I was trying to build my offline business, and I was like. what are you doing at least tell us i'm like dad i'm figuring out <laughs> like i don't know what to do and my dad gave me this timeline he's like till 25 i was 16 ah. and luckily for some reason i got out of school at the age of 16 like nice. 12th i graduated 12th in at the age of 16 you escaped early ha ah, yeah escaped early let's just say that so <laughs> my dad told me that till 25 you have time nice do whatever the fuck you want to do wow fail learn do whatever you want to do you're going to have house because this is the house we own so you're going to live here we're not going to kick you out you're going to get food you're going to get clothes you have this is what you have okay probably slowly 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 we'll keep putting foundation we'll keep cutting down your pocket money and all of that as you grow but these thing three things you're going to have till the time you turn 25 right after till 25 if you figure out something by your own out of your passion keep doing that for rest of your life wow if not I'm going to kick you and make you do what I know. So either you figure out what you know or you I'll make you like I'll make you do stuff I know. Wow. Yeah. Very good framework. I loved it. I started figuring out and I kept telling everyone what are you doing? I'm figuring out. I've time till 25. <laughs> I've time till 25. <laughs> and I'm 25 today, I'm still figuring out. In fact, figuring out I've made enough uh I think I've made this property good enough. that proudly when my dad asked me what i do i'm doing figuring out <laughs> perfect it's, it's become a thing of its own yeah <laughs> now it has become it is now giving me bread butter and everything in my life <laughs> i tell you as much choice i had my dad looked at me dead in the eye and said uh, you're going to pick engineering but i'm going to let you choose which branch of engineering you might want to <laughs> the generosity of that really caught me off guard right so uh, but besides that kind at least he was kind <laughs> that's bad and i've always believed that you need a chip on your shoulder right in order to get far that hunger sort of exists in your scenario it was an actual timer that was there before you're 25 in a lot of people scenario it's surprisingly your goddamn neighbor right your max card is probably the only reason why you need to exist and i love your mom to rub it in someone else's face and wow things can get petty and competitive there now can't it and that that eventually creates a chip on your shoulder right yeah. you will have this one relative or uncle or cousin who's absolutely crushing it in academics yeah and now he's the art stick oh my god <laughs> you don't even get me started all my cousins are toppers <laughs> like straight out right so okay my dad he was a state topper let's just not uh, go so there. things began a lot closer at home itself right so and what that what that eventually creates is a is a canister uh, th- there's so much pressure that you either uh, just go pop or you find a way in order to have that outlet into like a good avenue yeah and that chip on the shoulder is usually what has created some of india's best entrepreneurs right and uh, i think as long as that exists in some way it's not it's not crippling but it's all that that little bit of hunger that allows you to go that extra mile i the hunger part i want to end this podcast with the hunger part is that 
I keep saying this, I've been fortunate with the kind of parenting I've had. I think if I don't do something big in my life, it will be really bad for the kind of parenting I've gotten. I think someone else would have gotten then who could do like my parents have never pressured me to do anything. They have always instilled the self belief in me. They've they ex- absolutely good. All the good things you can think about it, my mom and dad, mom taught me to be generous, keep giving, giving, giving so that you get great value without expectations all like all the fundamentals of how to be a good human being my parents have put in me okay so that is really good but still because i was born in an environment where everyone around me would top us right in fact my best friends like close friends usually like toppers have topper friends mm-hmm. and like you know average people have average friends my average like i was like 50 60% student but my top four friends i used to hang out with they were all 90 plus Hmm. I don't know how this happened. My cousins, they were 90 plus. So I've always had this feeling that I'm not enough. I had this inferiority yeah. uh, complex. And till 12th, I was not able to speak in English properly. Right. So obviously, and the place where I come from, Eng- speaking in English is cool. It's considered cool. Like you have to be in the hip guys. Gotcha. And we were not that rich. Hmm. So I always had this inferiority complex. And that gave me the hunger that I want to become better than my friends. Right. I want to become better than... my dad's friends i want to become better than my cousins and everyone that drove me to do whatever we are doing right for sure yeah like so like hunger is really important and i feel most of the people see it as a pressure like most of the people would see it as ki okay my dad forced engineering on me but you saw that opportunity in the diversity most of the people would feel that oh i am not enough is bad thing to do so i saw that opportunity there and i think we people should figure out what drives them and what keeps them hungry that is the only way to go ahead regardless of which field you choose completely here you can only play the hand you're dealt with yeah. so might as well now try optimizing that oh sweet played in the best way possible that's it thanks a lot for doing this man i'm sure that people would have gotten a lot of insights from it i'm going to definitely if you have any uh, books or insights or some blogs to put out or i'm going to put the links of it and definitely definitely people are going to follow you and find out more about your journey So thanks a lot man thanks for this